Good morning, and welcome to Bible Heritage. We're happy to have you here in the house with us and also on the internet. Today is Father's Day. We have any fathers in the house? Amen. Let's give our fathers a big clap of praise. Our verse this morning is Ephesians 6 and 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the disciple and instruction of the Lord. It's very important that we take our roles as parents serious. And not all the time do we see that. But today, in this day and hour, we need to take our role as a parent serious. So if you're a father, whether it's biological or not, even if you don't have children, you are being watched. These children are watching what you do. And you are a living book to them. They're doing what you do. So I challenge you to guard yourself ground yourself in your word, and be that godly example for everyone, especially our children. I have um, Make a Difference for Jesus flyers out there, and this is what I do every month. I do something different with the children. There's three different things, the prayer zone, Bible fun day, and um, our bacon tape. This explains what we do in detail and it just changes each month. So I encourage you to get involved. Be looking forward to hearing from all of you about helping with our Vacation Bible School that's coming up. Um, I know it's a month early, but I want you to get encouraged and get ready to let's pack this house for the Lord. Because the more children we get in, the more families we can reach the more we can put God's word out. And that's what we're here for. We're not here just to be Bible heritage in these four walls. We're here to reach the world. We are the hands and feet. So with that being said, I want to go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, I ask you right now, God, to just minister and move in this house as only you can, Lord. Pour your presence out upon us, Lord. Give us that holy unction, that want to, Lord. Fill our hearts, God, and fill our house, Lord. We ask you to do more exceedingly abundantly than we could ever imagine, God. And we just thank you for all that you've done and all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to welcome our guest this morning. We're glad that you're with us. And Y'all stand and let's sing. Let's praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We're glad to have brother and sister Kane with us. John Kane has preached here in the past. Some of the older folks may remember him. Uh, but uh, brother John's one of the first people that ever spoke in my life that uh, I was praying and praying and praying. Lord, should I pastor this particular church? I was 23 years old. He didn't know me from Adam. And he pointed his finger at me and just said, young man, that which God has called you to do, he's equipped you to do. And the power of God hit me, and I flew 10 feet backwards in there. He never touched me. He was still on the stage. It was a Holy Ghost thing. He, the Spirit of God hit me, and I flew. My head hit the, the pew, and I splattered on the ground. Never felt it. Never had any pain from it. It was just a Lord thing, you know. But um, when, I, when I was on the floor, the Lord confirmed to me, that, that he had called me to that church and uh, went and pastored my very first church um, uh, and just had a wonderful time in the Lord. And so I want to thank him publicly for his investment in my life. And he's here again investing in me today. And I thank God for him and his wife and for the work of the Lord and the work of the Holy Ghost because he knows what we have need of before we even ask. Praise the Lord. He's an old time God. Yes, he is. He's an old time God. Yes, he is. Oh, he's an old
victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. Hallelujah. I heard an old, old story.
just ran out of money or ran out of means or I just needed the Lord to work out something for me. And I learned this song back in the 80s. They that wait upon the Lord. It's a scripture. I believe it's Isaiah 41. Does that sound right? I think it's Isaiah 41 where it says, uh, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. And I used to pray that prayer and I used to sing that song. And every time in my life over the last 50, almost 50 years of being filled with the Holy Ghost, I have sought the Lord. And God has always, and I'm an A-L-W-A-Y-S, always met my needs. Whether it's a healing, a deliverance, a provision, whatever it's been, God has always done the impossible. But you have to wait on the Lord. It don't come instantaneously. Most of the time, at least in my life, it hasn't. Most of the time, I've had to wait on the Lord and just trust Him. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him. sung it all my life, but I haven't memorized it. It's called Farther Along We'll Know All About It. Farther Along We'll Understand Why. Cheer up, my brother. Live in the sunshine, I believe it says. Yep. Yep, it does say that. <laughs> my memory didn't fail. Praise God. We'll understand it by and by. There are things that you are going through right now that you do. Hey, Sister Alyssa, girl, go get the baby. If they know she was here, they'd have been run back there. It's okay. Hey. She knows where she goes. <laughs> okay. Alyssa, stand, stand right there with oh, wow. you go over. Honey, honey, will you, your honey, your name, honey, yes, sir. <laughs> Alyssa lost her mother this week, and her mom was young. And, uh, I want us to pray for strength for Alyssa. Oh, well, it ain't on there. No wonder it's not coming off. <laughs> but we're going to pray that God will give you supernatural. she was born. You dated the date you were taking her home. It's no surprise to you, but it sure is a surprise to us. And God, it's 
certainly a surprise to this sweet daughter of birth. And Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that supernaturally you will give her strength to go through this trial, and especially tomorrow afternoon, that funeral that she has to go through. Yes. I pray, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, that she will feel the touch of the Holy Ghost, that she will feel that you, are, you haven't forsaken her, that you are looking out for her best interests, and her daddy, Lord, and those siblings, Lord. I pray, God, that you supernaturally touch them because a mighty void is there with the mama gone. And so I pray, Father, that you will undertake by your mighty power in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Michael's on time. All the time. Praise the Lord. Father Long. We'll know all about it. Tempted and tried, we're off base to wonder why it should be thus all the day long.
Bibles, turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 12. We're going to skip verse 11 until next week. And we'll come back to verse 11 next week. I want to thank y'all for praying for my father. I feel a real difference in his disposition. Uh, he has assured me that he's made things see a difference in him. He's not perfect. I'm not perfect, but I do see a difference in him. And he's coming to my home Wednesday under hospice care. And so just uh, keep our family in prayer as we go through this little journey. Um, and uh, I want to do everything I can to make him as happy and uh, comfortable and, and uh, give him everything that he needs in his uh, last salt <laughs> you know if I'm dying give me all the ice cream I want and all the fried chicken I can eat and all the salt I can have you know why put people like that on a diet I mean good gracious unless you ask for it leave me alone let me go out happy Amen. praise the Lord well I have more time so long it's all crooked praise the Lord let's look at Matthew 6 12 and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Father, in the name of Jesus, anoint my mind. Let me remember everything that you spoke to me. Lord, let me speak as the oracles of God. And we bless you today. Hear, let the folks hear what needs to be said in Jesus' name. Amen. There's an area in all of our lives that all of us, all of us struggle with, and that's in the area of forgiveness. I will think that I have forgiven a person, and I'll see them at the store, and then I'll go to the next aisle because I really just don't want to deal with them or talk with them or have to go through another opportunity to forgive them. Have, you know, the Bible says to forgive somebody 70 times 7. That's 490 times, and there are some folks that have gone beyond that limit. And you say to yourself, okay, Lord, past that, what do I do? And, and, and sometimes you have to avoid people that will cause you that much struggle and that much pain to protect yourself and so that you won't fall into sin. But uh, in all of our lives, there are people that offend us, people that get our, our feelings hurt, people that use us, people that take advantage of you, family, friends, co-workers, bosses, neighbors, children, grandchildren, just in general hurt will cause unforgiveness to come in our lives. And you have to notice it when you first discern it. And you have to rebuke the devil. And you have to read the word. And you have to remind yourself of truth. So much so that you will not fall into the sin of unforgiveness. I can't think of a single person that I've ever met that hasn't struggled at one point or another in the area of unforgiveness. A Catholic priest by the name of Robert Hagedon wrote the following. When I was first ordained a priest, I believe that over 50% of the problems of people were at least in part due to unforgiveness. And after 10 years in ministry, I revisited the topic and my estimate increased to 75 to 80% of all health, marital, 
family and financial problems came from unforgiveness. But now, after more than 20 years in ministry, I've concluded that 90% of all problems are rooted in unforgiveness. And I think there's a lot of merit to this priest's comment. We have to mull it over in our minds for ourselves. Someone once said that unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die because unforgiveness will kill you slowly, spiritually mostly, and mentally and physically next. To be a Christian, according to C.S. Lewis, means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in me. There have been times in my life where I've had to pray for God to forgive me for things that I was ashamed of. There have been things that I've done in my life that I wish that I had never done. If I could take an eraser and erase that part of my life out, I would. But if God forgave me of those horrible things that I did, then certainly he should expect me to be able to forgive the other person for doing something like that to me. Because who am I that I am better, that God can't forgive me, and then I can't forgive the next person? Unforgiveness is choosing to stay trapped in a jail cell of bitterness, serving time for somebody else's crime. That's a good one right there. I don't know who said that. John R. Rice, the great old Baptist preacher, said, when it boils down to its essence, unforgiveness is hatred. And that's exactly what it is. Hallelujah. 1 John 1, 9 has been my best friend for 63 and a half years that I've lived on this earth. It says, if we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I have had to go before the Lord and weep before the Lord and say, I've sinned and I'm sorry, Lord. Please forgive me. And God in his mercy through his precious blood that he dripped while hanging upon the cross and taking the stripes upon his back the blood that flowed from Jesus has been applied to my life and I have been set free and delivered and healed and, and, and cleansed from sin that I have done because I claimed 1 John 1, 9. That's a scripture you must all put to memory and always quote it almost every day. <laughs> if you've committed a sin, ask the Lord to forgive you. The Bible is clear uh, that, that there are things that hinder us from being forgiven ourselves. The word says in Matthew 6, 12, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So if somebody's done me wrong and I refuse to forgive them, how can I expect God to forgive me? Mark 11.25 says, Whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive your trespasses. Our being forgiven is hinged upon forgiving others. We are forgiven much, so we must also forgive much. Pride is the main reason why we choose not to forgive this person because we feel like they're, they're not worthy or they haven't asked us for forgiveness or whatever the reason may be. Something that happened 35 years ago could still be a grudge deep inside of you and you have to pray and say, God, take that grudge out of me. Take that unforgiveness out of me. It could be a boss, an employee, a co-worker, a neighbor, a family member, a church member, a pastor, 
a teacher. It could be anybody. It could be the person that cut you off the road this morning on your way to church. It could be the person that honked their horn at you when you were sitting at the, at the red light. But I'm here to tell you that God in His mercy will forgive if we will forgive others for what they have done to us. Praise the Lord. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. Hallelujah. Isn't it amazing what the Lord has done? Hallelujah. We are always looking for reasons not to forgive. Well, he hasn't asked me to forgive. He doesn't deserve my forgiveness. I hope they burn in hell for what they did. What they did is so bad, I can't even talk about it, let alone forgive them. Might be jealousy. That one hits me square in the eye, because a lot of times it is jealousy. Others are more successful than I am, and so I don't forgive them for being successful. Isn't that stupid <laughs> to not forgive a co-worker because they sell more than you do or, the, or not to forgive another person because they make more money than you do or they drive a better car than you do? Uh, that is like unforgiveness. There are some people with a 30-year ministry and some people with a 60-year ministry, and they both have 100 people in their church. What's the difference? They're both, if they're both in obedience to the Lord, the numbers is up to God. The Bible says, I, talking about Jesus, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So someone else got the position I wanted. They hurt my children. They can hurt me, and I can forgive them all day long, but if they hurt my children, and that's a hard one. That fellow that beat my daughter up all the time, it was hard for me to love him. It took me a long time to forgive him. It took me a long time to just accept that he needs God. I even prayed one time, and I hate to admit this, but I even prayed. I said, Lord, if he's not going to make it into heaven, just take him on to hell now. He deserves to be there now, not, not when he's old. That was not was 100% fleshly Randy. And so I had to repent of that. And I had to say, God, put a love in my heart for that man and not a hatred. And, 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 and that's not easy. And what I'm talking about today is not easy. The red letters of Jesus that I've been preaching on, every single thing that Jesus said is not easy. Amen. But it is still a requirement for us to try to do Amen. and to strive. And I will tell you, the bottom line is, I cannot do it in myself. Amen. I have to have the Holy Ghost to change me Amen. enough to where I can forgive that other person. Right. Well, he or she will never be able to take away the pain that they cause. So I can't forgive them. Well, they raped me. They murdered my uh, family member. They molested my family member. Uh, other excuses that sound legitimate. Uh, I'll forgive them after and only after they apologize to me. Well, I'm going to tell you what. Jesus was on the cross and he made the statement, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Stephen was being stoned and he was, his lights were about to go out and he was about to, he said, I see Jesus standing at the Father's right hand. But yet Stephen, that great, great uh, um, deacon of the church said, Father, don't hold this sin to their charge. Now they were stoning him. They were killing him. Why? Because of his uh, uh, stance on Jesus. They were killing him for righteousness sake. And yet he said they don't even know what they're doing. 
And I'm going to tell you what. A lot of your co-workers, your neighbors, your family members will be used by the devil to get under your last nerve or your, under your skin, however you want to phrase it. The devil will use somebody that you love very much to hurt you terrible. And you have to say, Father, they might not even know that they're being used by the devil to get under my skin. So I have to forgive them. Another excuse is I never got resolution from this before he died. So now I just have to let it go. Let me tell you this. There's been some people that have died. That I've had to say father. Now they can't hear me say I'm sorry. They can't hear me make restitution for this. But father you know it. And you're the only one that counts right now. So whether they're dead, you still pray. And you say, Father, forgive me for the resentment I had towards dead George or dead Thomas or dead whoever. And you say, Lord, take that out of my heart that every time I think about his name or if I happen to walk by his graveside, I wouldn't spit on his grave. But I would literally just talk to the Lord and say, Father, take every root of bitterness out of me. We could spend hours and hours and find all kind of legitimate excuses why we don't want to forgive. But they don't hold water against the book called the Bible. Did you hear what I said? They don't hold water against the book called the Bible. The Bible teaches us to constantly forgive. No exceptions. No loopholes. Right. It doesn't matter if they raped or murdered or stole or whatever. Yes, it was horrible. Yes, what they did is almost unforgivable in the eyes of the natural. But we are not natural. Amen. We're filled with supernatural. It's called Holy Ghost living on the inside of us. So if he is living on the side of us, I have to do what he says. If I'm truly saved, I'm giving control up of my life to God. And I'm saying, take over, God. You do with me what you want to do. You have your way. And if it means me forgiving somebody that doesn't deserve it, then Lord... That's between you and them. You are the righteous judge. I'm not. Amen. The Bible says, judge not lest you be judged. For in the same manner in which you judge, you shall be judged. We have to forgive. Luke 23 is the scripture where Jesus is hanging on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrated his love toward us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So he, while I was still enjoying sin as a lifestyle, he said, I'm still willing to die for you. To take the nails in your hands and in your feet and the crown of thorns on your head and your beard plucked. And he, he was still willing to have his back. A, a, a lash 39 times with a cat of nine tails so that there were hundreds of stripes and the flesh was ripped off of his body. His face was unrecognizable and yet he did all of that knowing that I would backslide, knowing I would sin, knowing I would do the horrible things that I did and he still said, I am not willing that any should perish but that all would come to, to full repentance. Matthew 6, 14 through 15 says, If you forgive men your trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. That right there, if we stop, we should say hallelujah. Amen. And we should say that's reason enough right there. Because I don't know about you, but I, on a regular basis, need forgiveness of sin. Amen. If it's not a sin of commission, it's a sin of omission. Amen. 
which yes. means it's something I should have done, but I didn't do. Amen. It might not be that I murdered or raped or lusted or, or, or stole or lied, but it might be that I was supposed to take a cake in, in Jesus' name over to somebody or mow somebody's grass or call somebody for prayer and I didn't do it. That's also a sin. Amen. And so I, I every day need a heavenly father to forgive me of my sin. So if I stop right there at 14, verse 14, that's enough right there. To a reason why I need to forgive so I can get forgiveness. Amen. But then he said, if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither your father will forgive yours. Second reason why. He refuses to forgive us if I'm holding unforgiveness towards somebody. I write prisoners every month. I have a relationship with guys that I ministered to years and years ago or people that might have grown up in my church and steered off and got the wrong way or a family member of one of my former church members and, and I've been a pen pal to them every month for for. 14 years, one guy wrote me a letter yesterday telling me how he has surrendered his heart and life totally to Jesus Christ. Now, I have wrote him every month for 14 years, and I have encouraged him. I've given him words from the Lord, and many times he would write back and say, you just don't know how on time this letter was for me. But he wrote me a letter yesterday, and he said, Pastor, you, you, you have written me for 14 years years. You've not missed a month. And, and, and I, I can't thank you enough for doing that. He said, but I finally, finally have totally surrendered myself to the Lord. And I want you to know that I have finally totally surrendered to the Lord. This generation that we're ministering to today, it ain't going to take one time or two times or five times or ten times I went to a man's house Wednesday night that I had been visiting for over two years on a faithful basis. And the Lord will speak to me and say, go to their house and talk to them. And they've not yet one time stepped foot in this church. And, and I wish to God they'd step foot in the church. And I've even encouraged them, if you don't want to come to my church, there's, there's 300 churches in town. <laughs> Certainly you can find one. That will fit your needs and minister to your family the way that you want. But you go, you need to go to church and you get your family in church, you know. But it's an investment in people that we need to do for the long term. Until we take our last breath or they take their last breath. We've got to do everything we can to see people come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And find the peace of God that passes understanding. And there will be people that don't deserve your forgiveness in the natural. But because you are a child of God, you've got no option. There is no option. After today's sermon, you have no excuses because you know the truth. And the Bible says the truth will set you free. If there is somebody that you cringe when you think about them or, or you have unforgiveness towards that person for whatever reason, you have no excuse. You have got to give it to God. And, and it might take you, it might take you a while. Do you know when Joseph's brothers showed up uh, 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 and, and he was shaven and looked like a, a Egyptian and they're sitting there in the dining hall and he wants to tell them that he's their brother, but he doesn't tell them he's their brother for probably weeks. And I believe with all my heart that the reason Joseph didn't tell them till almost the very end that he was their brother and he forgave them, he didn't say that because he was still working on Joseph. Amen. He was still saying, I need your help, God. These fellas put me in a pit and they sold me to some Ishmaelites. And I went through hell on earth. I was a slave in Potiphar's house. I was accused wrongfully by Sister Potiphar. I was sold into a, to a prison house. 
and I was there for two years. I gave a word to a baker and a candle maker or whatever they were, a, a baker and something else, uh, and, and, and they forgot about me. They promised me they were going to tell the king about me, but they didn't do it. And, and then I wound up second to Pharaoh. And now I'm in a place of prestige. I've got a wife, I've got a family, i got all the money I want, all the prestige I want. But there was that one thing still hindering him, his brothers. That unforgiveness. And finally, when they walked into that last room where it says that they were going to eat together, he said, I am Joseph the brother that you sold into slavery. And boy, they got scared because they knew what they deserved. They deserved to be killed for what they had done. But he said, y'all meant harm for me. But what y'all meant for harm, God meant for good. Every bad thing that's ever happened in my life Every bad person that's ever done me wrong, I'm here to tell you that God says in his word, all things work together for good. Who's good? My good. Your good. To those who love the Lord. To those who are called according to his purpose. So it is for my good that they hurt me. It's for my good that I went through what I did. You say, you mean that molestation was for my good? Yes, because now you understand what other kids went through and you're able to minister what I could never do That's right. because you've been there. You understand that, and I don't. So you have something in your tool chest to minister to people that I could never do. Amen? Amen. So we got more amen than that one. You're either asleep or not obedient. Word says in Matthew 18, Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him up to seven times? Now, Peter's being really gracious. Because if I have to forgive Clinton seven times for something, you know, and he's never done me one time, let alone seven, he's been a good man. But let's just use him as an example today. If Clinton did me wrong seven times, I'm probably going to avoid Clinton. No, had nothing to do with him. Because if he's hurt me seven times, that's a lot of times. So that means I need to avoid those that cause division among you and, and avoid them. That's what the word says. But Jesus said, no, Peter, not seven times. He said, 70 times seven. So, I'm not going to count 490 times. I'm going to lose track somewhere around 12. If I can't remember what I had for breakfast, I surely ain't going to remember if it's number 238 or if it's 239. I'm going to be off somewhere along the track unless I'm writing it down. But if you do that, you're really messed up. <laughs> Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servant. And when he began to settle accounts, one brought to him, owed 10,000 talents. Now, 10,000 talents was an extravagant wage for a lifetime. Think about that. This man that owed him money owed him a lifetime wage. Think about it. If you made $30,000 a year and you, lit, you worked 50 years, that's a lot of money. Can't do the math for my head. Maybe Michael can do that. Oh, it'll take me a little second. Though. Take you a second. But uh, the truth of it is, it's a lot. It's a lot. One point five million. One point five million dollars. Now I tell you what, I ain't never made a million dollars. If you had it every time since I mowed grass at ten years old, I ain't never made a million dollars in my lifetime. All cumulative added up together. And yet this man owed over. $1.5 million to this man. And the Bible says he was not able to pay his master. 
And he commanded him to be sold and his wife and his children and all that he had that payment may be made. That was justified. The servant therefore fell down before the master saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Then the master of the servant was moved with compassion, released him and forgave him the debt. Now that's something to shout about. You owe $1.5 million and it's forgiven. Well, that is a shouting hallelujah time. Amen. But verse 28 says, but the servant went out and found out one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Now, a hundred denarii was a day's wage or possibly three months' wage. Either way, it's not that much money when you compare it to 1.5 million that he was forgiven. So, he laid his hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe. So this fellow fell down on his feet and begged him. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Isn't that what the guy just did? The guy he owed? And he got mercy. He said, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And he, and he would not. And he went and threw him in prison until he should pay the debt. He didn't practice what was given to him. And that parable was given to us so that we would realize that if God's forgiven us all the things that we've done wrong in our lives, omission and commission, then who are we not to forgive one person that's done us wrong? God is looking at our sin the same, same way. I see this brother or this sister in sin, and I'm shocked. The other day I heard about a person that had fallen into sin, and my first thought was, oh my God, how could he do such a thing? Now, you know what that is? That's judgmentalism. And that's what I was doing. And I caught myself. I caught myself doing that. And I said, Father, I've done worse than that. Will you please forgive me for judging that man for what he did? And will you help me to remember to pray for him who's probably struggling with forgiving himself, mm -hmm. who's probably going through all kinds of hell in all kinds of ways. He needs the Lord to help him. His family needs help. His church needs help. Who am I to put my finger of judgment on him. And yet that was my first instinct. Why? Because that's human nature. That's what we do. We judge other people. We don't know their story. We don't know what they've been in. What's the old Indian adage, adage? Until you've walked a mile in their moccasins, you don't know what they've been through. And even the most meanest, hatefulest man even the one that stole from our parents or stole from our brother or stole from us, we, we don't know what they've been through. There's a lot of people that we need to stop and say, you know what? My, my brother and I, or me and somebody, we were talking, oh, it was my spiritual daughter and I, we were talking the other day. And I said, LaDonna, I said, uh, my dad, uh, the Lord helped me to forgive him a while back. And I said, uh, uh, and, and I know she's dealing with that same thing. Her grandpa died, and he never did say, per se, what he was sorry for. He should have been sorry for a lot of things that he did and he didn't do. And uh, she and I both came to the conclusion that it was better for us to forgive them, even if they're still a scoundrel, even if they die a scoundrel. It's, it's better for us to live in forgiveness and not yield to that. When you see somebody at the dollar store and you feel like you want to run away or you say, oh, there's that lesbian, there's that homosexual, there's that, that person that did this to the church, blah, 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 whatever it might be. If that's the first thought that comes to your mind, you need to hit the deck and pray, 
I'm not saying get on your knees in the dollar store, but it wouldn't hurt. Amen. Get up the back where there ain't nobody. <laughs> or go to your car and pray. And say, Lord, I've judged that person. And Lord, forgive me for doing that. I have to work on me all the time because I was raised in a family that judged others. That was our nature. That's what we did. We didn't drink, smoke, cuss, or chew. We didn't go out with girls that do. We, we didn't do anything wrong, per se, like that. But boy, we could judge somebody in a heartbeat. And so when you had that history for all these years, it's been something that I've had to let the Lord crucify in me on a regular basis. And he's still crucifying. Every, every time I think I got it licked, the enemy will pop up with some other little thing. Forgiveness moves past seeing the sin to seeing the person and unforgiveness. You know, I, I look at my dad and I think when he was 12 years old, his dad and mom divorced. His mother ran off with a, she was 56, she ran off with a 26-year-old man. And my grandfather ran off with another woman. I don't remember how old she was, but she was a little younger than him. I don't know how much, but it doesn't matter. But I know one thing they did. They forgot they had children. They forgot they had kids. And my daddy had to be raised one day at his grandma's house, one day at his aunt's house, one day at his uncle's house, another day at another aunt's house. And he was drug up from 12 to 16 years old when he met my mother. And they got married when he was 16. And daddy raised himself. He didn't have an example. He didn't know any better. So all the things that he did that I judged him for all those years. And, and what he did was wrong. But you know what? The Holy Ghost, that's his job. Sure. It's not my job. And so I had to call him and say, Daddy, I'm sorry for judging you and I love you and now he tells me he loves me and I tell him I love him back and the good news is I mean it <laughs> I mean it you know the difference don't you when you say I love you you don't necessarily mean it you know and uh, but I mean it now but I had to go back and look at how he was raised and say, you know what? He didn't know no better. Right. That's not true. Mm -hmm. He didn't know any better. <laughs> That's this little room that you have to keep them straight. <laughs> it's good people. But the thing is, we have to forgive. Galatians 6 1 tells us the best thing to do. It says, if you see your brother overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, you which are spiritual. Restore such a one in a spirit of meekness or gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. So that takes us to a new level. And I'm going to close with this. Why is it important that God's people operate in, un in, in, in forgiveness? get rid of unforgiveness no matter how long it takes you to do it why should we do that it's found in the scripture in verse 18 of our text assuredly I say to you whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven again I say to you if two of you agree on earth concerning anything they ask it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. But where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm there in the midst of them. Unforgiveness breaks the power of agreement. If I can't be in agreement with you, my prayers are hindered. They're hindered. If I can pray till the paint comes off the wall and the ceilings and it goes to the ceiling and bounces back down, I've got to forgive. 
And then I can come together with my brothers and sisters in the Lord, and we can say, Lord, this person's having a financial difficulty. This person's having a problem with their health. This person's having a marital problem, whatever it might be. And we call on the name of the Lord Jesus, and he hears our cry. Because we have walked in forgiveness, and we're in unity. Two or the three are touching him, and he's in the midst of it. But if me and Alicia are fighting, and Sister Hook calls us and says, pray for us, I'll have to tell her, we'll pray in a little while. <laughs> <laughs> and then i got to go to Sister Honey there and say, I am so sorry for what I did or said. Will you forgive me? We gotta pray for so and so. So if you forget, don't forgive me. We gotta we gotta get this uh, over real quick now. <laughs> we gotta pray for Sister Hook. She needs it right now, and we've gotta make things right. In fact, if I don't have things right with my wife, the Lord says He won't even hear my prayer at all, just for that. So let's pray, Father, in the name of Jesus. If there's someone in this room that's having a struggle with forgiveness. I'm not calling for altar call. I'm not calling for people to embarrass themselves. Father, this is between you, them, and the Holy Ghost. And I pray, Father, right now in Jesus' name, that you'll begin to do a work in them to break them. Break them as you've broken me many times. And I pray you continue to break me over and over as often as I need it. Break me, Lord until I can totally surrender and not be judgmental and not be critical and not be the person that has unforgiveness in his heart. And we give you glory and praise and honor for that that you've forgiven us for. Now forgive them and help them in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Before we go, we want to pray for those that are sick, Sister Barbara. And Sister Marilyn today are both sick and really need a touch from the Lord. Um, let's pray. And Bascom is uh, having a struggle this morning. Let's pray for God to touch him. Write this down before it loses. y'all have anything let's keep remembering uh, Alyssa's family especially tomorrow around four three and four o'clock probably two o'clock when they get there for the private viewing please start praying for them uh, God knows brother Maru Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, Lord, that you will touch Judy and Emory today. I forgot to mention them, but they're sick. I pray you touch Barbara and heal her body. Marilyn, heal her, God. Bascom, deliver him in the name of Jesus. Alyssa's family, God, even now, today, as we've already prayed, continue to minister to them, and especially tomorrow at 2 and 3 and 4, when they go through all these experiences together, Lord, to lay her body at rest, help them to picture her and envision her where she is now in the presence of the Lord. And God, I pray that you touch her and, and minister to that whole family in the name of Jesus. I pray for Elaine Hickson. Father, you see her condition. 
and you know, Lord, what's going on with her. And I pray, Father, that you will heal her body by the mighty power of the blood of Jesus. I pray for Nathan uh, Bixon, Lord, that he'll get a good report from the doctor tomorrow. God, give him supernatural strength to overcome even the effects of the chemotherapy, radiation, any kind of treatments that he had. Heal him from all of that in the name of Jesus. I pray for Bill Spack to be whole in Jesus' name. For Iris, continue touching her body, Lord, in Jesus' name. For um, uh, my dad, Alton Richardson, I pray, Lord, as I bring him home Wednesday, that you will have your way in his life, Lord, and just minister to him yes. in the way that he needs, in the name of Jesus. I pray for Tiffany Seals, that the tumor in her breast will be removed in the name of Jesus, that uh, Barbara's relative uh, that needs comfort, the Dowling family, that Ray and Linda Fisher, that they would receive strength in the name of Jesus. Touch Fred in the name of Jesus. I pray, God, that you will minister to Katie Porter and uh, Bill's sister Pam. Loose them in the name of Jesus. Give them what they need. We pray for Lily Mae Kerouac in the name of Jesus for strength. We pray, Lord, for Brandon's son, uh, or Brandon, uh, that's uh, Sister Barbara's grandson, that his finger will continue to heal completely. The Sister Hook's heart will be whole in the name of Jesus. In fact, right now we stop. Alicia, tap, get the oil right there. Lady, put some oil on Sister Hook's head. Her heart rate is not working the way it should. And let's pray for the mighty name of Jesus to touch her body right now with supernatural strength. In the name of Jesus. Yes, so many ladies come. Gather around you. Father, in the name of Jesus, touch Sister Hook. Loose her. Loose her. Loose her. Loose her. In the name of Jesus. Heart rate. I speak to you and command you to come back to normality in the name of Jesus. Be the way it's supposed to be right now in Jesus' name. Touch her by your power and give her supernatural strength, Lord, to do what she has to do in her home. And for herself, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we find you, Spirit, that will come against this prayer. Thank you, Lord. Spirit trying to hinder her. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name. Jesus' name. We thank you for it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Touch Diane Baldwin's grand or niece that has breast cancer, and I pray God that you will minister healing to the little. 12-year-old grandson, Lord, that had the bike accident and it put a hole in his pancreas. Mm -hmm. I pray, Father, that you heal it up. Mm -hmm. And I know you've kept him alive, and that's a miracle that he's alive. The doctors are amazed that we've been praying, Lord. And I pray, Father, that you will loose him completely so that they can let him go home uh, in the name of Jesus. I pray for uh, Sister Darlene, Sister Patty, that uh, she will be whole from those heart attacks. And uh, Belinda's co-worker, Agnes Carter, heal her of the uh, leukemia in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray for those on the evangelistic prayer list for each person that has written them out, Lord, and is praying for their children and co-workers and neighbors to be saved. Lord, we send the Holy Ghost to convict in the name of Jesus for the glory of God. Oh, God, we pray for these countries that don't have a missionary presence, uh, Somalia, Sudan, uh, Burkina, and Central African Republic. I pray in the name of Jesus that these four countries would have missionaries rise up and come, that shortwave radio, that the Holy Ghost would appear, and that the Spirit of God would move mightily in their midst. I pray against the gang culture in Garlington Heights, the Vibe Network, and Ware Manor, and Central Park Apartments. Father, that you will eradicate uh, gangs from our community. We've been a peaceful, loving community for many, many years, and now gangs are trying to raise up. Squash it now, in Jesus' name, for your glory. And we thank you for it now, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Don't forget your 
tithes and uh, your missions giving. Uh, the box is in the back. On your way out, if you want to put in an offering, just do it uh, at that place. Oh, and if you feel led to give toward the parking uh, debt reduction, put it on the envelope and land, and God will know what that means. And, uh, and the sister does too. <laughs> All right, God bless you. He loves you. Oh, 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 wait a minute. Father's Day. There's a gift right there on the back. Uh, David will help distribute out. And uh, if you're a man... You're not even a father. Take one anyway. Yeah. We got plenty.